The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. So Ben, on the Element 14 community, we've been getting a lot of requests for projects involving FPGAs. Ah yes, field programmable gate arrays. It's actually been over a year since we've done a project using one, so I think it's about high time for a refresher course. So do you have an idea for a project? Yeah, um, we can show people how to get started with an FPGA, how to select the one that's best for their needs, and then we'll create some custom code with it. We do have a future project coming up where we could really use an FPGA, so I think this will be a good fit. Sounds good. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. How can we make this portable? Inspired designs. I am the internet troll. Regrettable acting. Bat them hatches! Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Hey Ben, I heard we're working on FPGAs this week. Yes, I figured it'd be a good time for a refresher course. We also have an upcoming project where we're going to need one. Oh. Did you ever talk about it in school? Yeah, I had a really short class on them and I definitely would like to mess with them more. Do you remember what it stands for? Field Programmable Gate Array. Yes, that is correct. There's also something like an FPGA called a CPLD, mm -hmm. Complex Programmable Logic Device. You can use those if your design is simpler and they're slightly cheaper. But in this episode, we're mostly gonna talk about FPGAs. Well, what are some of the advantages of an FPGA? Okay, well, FPGAs can be used to create fast, low-level logic devices. Instead of like wiring up logic manually, which you can do, and maybe you still would do, you know, as part of your design process, you can design all of it in code, and then this chip can create it for you. And it's not a simulation, it actually is logic. So it runs very high speed. So it's great for high speed interfaces. Okay. Uh, if you do RAM, uh, HDMI, USB, anything that we need a lot of speed. Mm -hmm. You can also create a soft core, which is like building a microcontroller with the logic on the FPGA. And it doesn't need to take up the whole FPGA either, so you might use 60% of it on your soft core and you'd still have the other 40% to create high speed, low level interface. Well, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, and there's a lot of things you can't do with a microcontroller that you can do with an FPGA. Okay, what would some of the challenges of using an FPGA be? Well, um, it's a more expensive part compared to most microcontrollers. So if you're gonna use one, make sure that you need it and you can use as much of it as possible. For instance, like with a soft core. Although the soft cores, if you put them into a product, I believe there's also license fees involved in them. Like you have to pay for the IP of the core that you build. Okay. But you can you know, do, use demonstrations of them for free. It's only when you're like, okay, this is the core that I want, then you pay for it. Sure. Um, it also requires external components. I mean, granted, microcontroller does too, uh, but for instance, this has an EEPROM, that's a configuration device, and this actually programs the FPGA when it turns on okay. with the code that you want it to run. Mm -hmm. Also, multiple voltages are required. This one's got three different regulators on it, probably 3.3, 1.8, and the other one I can't think of, but you know, so if you're designing a board, you're gonna to have to actually add more chips to support this than right. you might with a microcontroller. And usually you're also gonna have a crystal as well. So a little bit more involved than creating a board around a microcontroller. All right, so there's some of the pros and cons of a FPGA. Now, when would you actually use one? Okay, well there might be a situation in which you have to replace a large amount of discrete integrated circuits with a single FPGA. Those circuits would take up space, it would take more time to place them, they would have a higher cost than just a single FPGA, so replacing a lot of things with one FPGA can be a good idea. Right. Also, if you want very high speed integration with other devices, such as a display or some sort of input, again, you can use a microcontroller, but a microcontroller is limited to the speed of its program loop. You can use interrupts in microcontrollers to get a better dividing of speed, but it's not always precise. It's more precise than like a system on a chip running Linux, but with an FPGA, every time that clock fires, the FPGA performs its function. Right. Okay. It's real logic, low level logic. So that means it's very fast. And you can hook up like a 50 megahertz crystal to it, and then actually use a phase lock loop to increase the speed even further. So FPGAs are basically when you need a lot of speed. 
Okay, I'm gonna look for an FPGA now. I will go to Newark Element 14. Let's see what they have. Let's just look through these and talk about, you know, why you might want one over another. Well, this one's a pretty nice one. I actually have one of these. The DE Zero Nano. It's uh, you know pretty reasonably priced. It has a lot of I.O. and it doesn't have a lot of extra stuff like SD cards and VGA ports. Um, those would be useful for our project, but the thing is, all this I.O. is left open because if you have a bunch of extra stuff on there, it might be handy for testing purposes, but if you also want to use the board to hook up a lot of extra things, you're gonna run out of I.O. because it's already been used up by things. Also, I believe this one, let's see if we can get a better picture. Yeah, this one is powered entirely by the USB port, so when you're developing it, you don't need to have a power supply and the USB, just plug it into USB. A limitation with that is you might not get a lot of power off of any of these pins that are intended for power, so you're not gonna be powering much for external devices. However, this one does have a little header here where you can plug in an alternate five volt supply. There's something else to consider with these boards. Um, you need to be able to program the FPGA. So you can get a separate device, like a USB blaster, which will allow you to program it, but most dev boards have this built in. And this DE0, you can see it right here. So when you plug this dev board in, your development environment will say, oh, you've got the USB blaster hooked up. Okay, we're going to use that to program the FPGA. And then also, uh, you want some sort of heartbeat indicator. There's, looks like eight LEDs here. So if you want to make sure that your code's at least working, you have some built-in LEDs to debug. But you don't have a bunch of extraneous things sucking up all your I.O. So I liked all the headers on this uh, DE0 Nano. I think that might be a pretty good choice, but we'll look around here. Okay, this is a CPLD, which is a complex programmable logic device. CPLDs are usually cheaper versions of FPGAs. They're not as complex or as capable, but if your design doesn't require an entire FPGA, you might be able to get by with a CPLD. So this is, might be a good choice if you want a lot of different I.O. I mean, this, look at this. It's got like VGA, serial, a built-in LCD, um, some LED numerals, a whole bunch, look at, wow, there's a lot of stuff on this one. Four push buttons, looks like about, you know, 16 or so switches, a bunch of lights, and then it also looks like it has quite a bit of RAM, Cyclone 4, an add-on board, so yeah, well, this is the DE2115. All right, so if you don't wanna to have to hook up anything to your dev board, it's already there for you, something like this would be a good choice. Oh, I have one of these, someplace. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is a good one too. Um, this is the um, Terra ASIC Altera board. Uh, it's a Cyclone 3, so it's an older FPGA. Uh, it's got some nice switches, VGA, an SD card slot. Pretty decent amount of I.O. available, even with the built-in thing. So this one's pretty nice. It's about $134. And you do have to give it an external power supply, but it does have a nice big red button when you want to turn it on and off. So this one's not bad. And the nice thing about having a row of switches is if you're doing something with memory registers, you can map those switches to a register. And just like an old school, like Altair 8800, you can flip the switches up to actually go directly to registers in your FPGA and then print their contents in hex on the seven segment display. So that's not a bad one either. So I went with the DE0 Nano and here's why. You can power it and program it easily with a USB connection. If you need more power, you can attach five volts right here. There's quite a bit of IO on it. There's RAM on it if you need additional RAM. It's a Cyclone 4 FPGA, which is um, pretty decent. Built-in USB blaster, configuration device, and it's a nice small footprint. Yeah, let's try this out. All right, we need a device file. So the device file has the parameters for whatever particular FPGA or family of FPGAs you're trying to use. Cordis 2, device installer, device files, there we go. Okay, select by device. We already have the software. I'm gonna go to Cyclone, Cyclone 4, for so the E, I think? Yes, all right. Okay, so right here, we have to make sure that whatever we download matches what we installed. So I installed 13.1, because I found this works pretty well for the range of devices I usually program with. So we need to install the same version of the devices for the software. So that would be 13.1 Web Edition. 
All right, so it includes a Cyclone 4, which is uh, what I'm using. So if I was using a newer version of the software, it wouldn't have support for something older like the Cyclone 3. Okay, I'm gonna navigate to the folder that contains the file I downloaded for the Cyclone 4. Now my cursor is going to flash. All right, Cyclone 3 and 4, yes, let's do that. Okay, all right, here we go. Hey Felix, come here. Hey, what's the emergency? I was just looking on Element 14 and I saw that this episode has bonus content. That's freaking awesome, what is it? So if people click on this link right here, they can watch okay. Ben use an FPGA to make a monitor for a giant Game Boy. Whoa, that sounds like something that cannot be missed. You gotta watch it. They should click right here. Click this link right here, this is one that I'm working on. Okay, now that we have some devices installed, we can load up Quartus 2. Usually you'll get uh, demo disks with your FPGA, and this will include sample projects as well as dun, 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 the Quartus software or whatever software you're using for the FPGA. I already had the software installed, so I didn't install this, although it probably would have had the device files I needed for this FPGA. So I'm gonna take a look at this disk I can see an Onion article right now. Local teen petrified as plastic tray juts out of computer unexpectedly. Let's make sure that this works. I'm looking at these demo files. Uh, default, that's probably a pretty good bet because it'll probably do some sort of pattern with the LEDs. Okay, so when we go into Quartus here, we wanna make sure we open project. Just selecting open would open just a file. Let's navigate to that. Okay, so this is the most important file. This is the Verilog file, and Verilog is the language in which we can program an FPGA. Okay, let's take a look at this. These are the actual connections that are going to be on the FPGA. We have a clock, 50 megahertz. That's actually something else that's important to notice when you're selecting an FPGA is what the clock frequency is, because um, that is used to drive everything, so if you're doing something for one FPGA and you have a clock frequency of 25 megahertz, you try to make that same code run on another FPGA, you have to change what the clock frequency is so it knows there's a difference. But you can take the 25 megahertz or the 50 megahertz and turn it into multiple other frequencies using phase lock loops. We'll get to that in a little bit. Okay, so we got LED key switch and then this is connected to the RAM on the bottom of the unit. The EPCS, that's the um, configuration device. That's what stores the DE Nano's configuration for loading the FPG and boot. So these are the connections. Then down here, these are the input outputs. So it's saying what the connection is. So the clock is an input. It's coming in from the crystal. LEDs are an output. And see how it has seven down to zero? That means it's an eight bit output, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Whereas with key, zero to one means there's two keys being used. I would assume that means these two buttons right here. Switch, three to zero. Okay, that's going to be talking about these little tiny dip switches here. I don't think I even wanna use those, they're so tiny. I don't think I can get those with my tweezers. Now here, the uh, SDRAM. We have 12 down to zero, which is a 13-bit address. So what would that be, like 16K, I think? Okay, so this is basically defining what all the inputs and outputs are for everything. And we'll need those later for the pin planner. We can also create internal registers and wires. See how this says register 26 down to zero? That's a 27-bit counter. That's not connected to anything externally. That's why we don't have it up here in the input and output. But we can use it internally to count. You can also create um, RAM inside of the FPGA. So there are things, you can create constructs inside of the FPGA that don't necessarily connect to the outside world, but they're affected by it. Let's look at the pin planner. This is pretty important. Now this will show a representation of whatever device we're using. So this is a BGA 
all the pads are on the bottom of it. So in the pin planner, it actually shows the pads on the bottom of it. If we were using an FPGA that had the pins on the side, like this package, see? It would show all the pins on the side. So this is actually a pretty good visual representation of what your FPGA is. Now, every one of these connections has a name. It's usually the letter and the number in a grid. So B8 would be right there, which looks like a clock input. Now down here is actually where the magic happens. Each one of these defined items from the other screen. So if we go up to, uh, let's go up to LED. So see how we said LED seven down to zero. So over here, I mean, this has already been filled out, but you'll see we have LED zero up to seven. And there's a few things we have to set for each one of these. Um, there's a location. So you can see where it is, pin A15, PA13. And there's banks. I mean, the banks aren't super important, but sometimes if you have one bank set to do a certain voltage, like 3.3 volts, then it also is not able to do other voltages. So you have to keep all of your different connection types in one bank. So you might not be able to do LVDS and 3.3 volt, low voltage TTL in the same bank. Um, the default is 2.5 volts, but you can set other things. You're usually not gonna run into like five volts with this. Everything's gonna be 3.3 volts or less. You can also do LVDS, low voltage differential signaling. Um, we've done examples with that before with a direct drive LCD. We won't really need that for the project we intend this for. 3.3 volt should be good. It looks like everything on this sample board is driven at 3.3 volt. Although you would probably be fine using the default if you create a new pin, which is 2.5 volts. So this is basically saying, you know, where is this connection LED zero attached to? What type of connection is it? You know, what IO standard we have by the voltage? And yeah, that's pretty much it. So if you, when you create something from scratch, you have to go in and fill all these things out. Just because you have a place for it and it compiles, it might not always work. Although the compiler is usually pretty good at telling you what won't work. Okay, so see this statement? Always at positive edge clock 50 or negative edge of reset N. So this is basically, good, whatever this is, is gonna happen at 50 megahertz, the positive edge of the clock. All right, so this, I mean, this is gonna kind of look like other languages, but you know, we, we don't have the curly brackets here. Instead of, you know, our braces like that, this uses begin and end. And you don't have to indent it like that. It's not like Python, it doesn't care, but it looks nice. So this is just um, running a counter and then driving the LEDs on the counter. So this is a pretty simple demonstration. So even though they set up the IO for the external RAM, they're not using it for anything. All right, so like anything else, this has to be compiled. I'm gonna go up here and hit start compilation. So this is gonna give us a report and tell us just how many elements we're using. Oh, let's make sure we see this. Okay, this is the process down here. See it running? Okay, it was successful. And if it's not successful, it'll definitely let you know. And you can look at like here. These are warnings. The warnings that it'll still work, but it's like, you know, this, you left something unconnected. In this case, it's probably telling us, yeah, we're not doing anything with the RAM, you know, we, we defined it, but we're not doing anything with it. Zero errors, 175 warnings, but it compiled. Um, this is something uh, important to look at. So this is the device itself. This is the actual FPGA. So logic elements, um, the FPGA is made up of many modules. Well, it looks like 22,320 in this case. And they're kind of general purpose modules that can be used for a lot of different things. And it takes a certain number of them to create your design. So this tells you how much of your FPGA you've consumed. This is a very simple program, so we've used less than 1% of everything. Something else that's important is total memory bits, zero of 608,000. That's your built-in RAM. That's the RAM that can be created within the FPGA, not necessarily the external RAM. So if you can use the RAM or RAM elements inside the FPGA, that's good because then you don't have to add any other chips. But this is in bits, so we take that number divided by eight and we have 76K of RAM. So that's not too bad. All right, and then we also see total PPLs, that's phase lock loop. So we can use a phase lock loop to take the 50 megahertz crystal in and use multiplication and division to turn that into other frequencies that we need. Although usually the FPGA will have an upper frequency limit. On this one, I'm guessing it'd probably be around five or 600 megahertz but that's pretty good. All right, let's get this sample code onto the FPGA. As I mentioned before, the USB will power this whole thing. Okay, so we wanna take note, the LEDs are dim. Um, this is running some other code. 
And the code that is running right now is what is in the configuration device. Okay, so we go into Programmer. Now when we compiled this, we created a file that we could use for programming. Now we're gonna go into the programmer and use it. It's a soft file. This is going to load the RAM on the FPGA. Um, so if you're just developing, you know, you don't have to configure the device every time. You can just load the RAM, which is a lot faster. Okay, so this is what we want to program. So we have to select hardware before it'll let us do it. Oh yay, we have a USB blaster. Okay, now it's gonna let us do it. JTAG, let's see what happens. So now the LEDs are pulsing beautifully. Okay, so that just loaded the temporary RAM on the FPJ. So if we unplug it and plug it back in, we don't have that program anymore. So let me show you how to make the program stick. Okay, now I'm going to program the configuration device. We've already created a soft file. We can use that to create our configuration file. I'm gonna to go to convert programming files. And this is different depending on your FPGA and your configuration device. I'll show you how I do it for this. So we're gonna use a JTAG indirect configuration file. And according to this dev board's data sheet, we need to select EPCS64. That's the type of configuration device. And that's actually this chip right here. That's going to configure the FPGA on boot. There are a few new FPGA chips like the Max series that have the configuration built in, which is pretty cool. Okay, so we have to set up the flash loader and the soft data. So the flash loader, I'm gonna add device, Cyclone 4E family, specifically the E22. We also need the soft data, which is what we're actually gonna put into it. And that's the file we already created when we did a test compile. Add the file, this is the one we just created. Okay, oh, one more thing, we wanna make sure compression is on. Okay, everything else looks good. Generate the file. Okay, so we created a JIC file. Now we go back to the programmer. This is here from before, so we actually have to get rid of it. So select the soft from before, delete it. And now we're gonna add the file. Here's the one we just created. Now this has changed. If you look down here, we're actually talking to the FPGA and the FPGA is then going to communicate with the configuration device. We have to set up program configure here, okay. Make sure we got the USB blaster. All right, this should work. Let's try it out. So right now, this is still just blank. There's no LEDs lit. This takes a little longer. So, you know, use a soft file right up until you know it works. And then once you're ready to program it, convert the file and then program it with the configuration device. Now they're still not doing anything. That's because we have to restart it. Sometimes there's a button to do that. I don't think this one has a button, so we're just gonna unplug it. And when I plug it back in, the LED should be pulsing. So the sample code should be burned into the configuration device. Okay, looks like we're good to go. So Ben, how did you end up using the FPGA? Well, we showed people how to select the best FPGA for their needs. Then we hooked it up to the computer and installed the software to program it. Then we did some example codes where we created a VGA display with pixels. Okay, didn't you get some code from your friend? Yes, Parker Dillman, AKA the Longhorn Engineer at Macrofab, had already written an FPGA driver for the Game Boy. It takes in the signals from the Game Boy's LCD and turns them into a nice VGA display using an FPGA. Hey Ben, I have an idea. What if we took this FPGA and the code you got from your friend, and in a future episode, made a giant Game Boy using this monitor as the screen? Well, people are always asking us for consoleized versions of portable systems, so yeah, why not? I mean, it's gonna be like two foot by three foot with giant buttons, are you sure? That sounds awesome. All right, we'll do that in our next episode. We'll see you next time. The superimposed link that I can't see, but I'm imagining is right here. You must click on it so you can watch the bonus content. It's right here. Click the link, it'll take you to the Element 14 website where you can watch the episode. The bonus content. Mm, you need to watch it, it's great. Tonight on The Haunting of Meatloaf. So there's been a lot of jibber jabber online about FPG. I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> Or you import bears to kill the gators? <laughs> what is this? Is this like the Simpsons? But then, then you have to, then there's too many bears. I don't think bears attack gators, do they? I don't think so either. Who wonder who would win in a fight? Attacked, yeah. Who would win yeah. in a fight? A bear or a gator? Let us know in the Element 14 community. What is it? Is it some sort of computer tongue? Ah, save me, Justin Bieber. 
The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com.